Hi folks, HR Funk here. With a revolver that might look familiar to you, this is the Model 66 Smith & Wesson revolver that I received a couple of months ago. And if you saw the video that I produced at that time, you know that when I first received this revolver, it essentially did not function. There was so much hardened old lubricant down inside the lock work that it was very difficult to squeeze the trigger in double action. In single action, it was very difficult to cock the hammer. And in fact, it was even difficult to open and close because of all of that old congealed hardened lubricant. And in that video, I completely disassembled the revolver and I completely cleaned the lock work. And at the end, the revolver was restored to fully functional condition. Now, if you didn't see that video, I'll post a link in the description to this video, and you'll be able to go back and watch that. Now, since the time that I recorded that video, I was able to come to a mutually beneficial trade arrangement with this revolver's former owner, and this is now my revolver, and it's part of my collection. So in this video, I'm going to change the one remaining thing that I would like to in order to enhance this revolver for my own use, and that is the weight of the double action trigger pull. Now the current weight is pretty much standard Smith & Wesson double action trigger pull, which is to say it's probably somewhere in the 12 pound area. I'm going to see if I can get a reading on this double action pull with my Lyman trigger pull scale, but it's probably in that vicinity. And I don't want to make it extremely light. I especially don't want to sacrifice any reliability in terms of ignition. So I'm going to be replacing the standard mainspring with a Wolf replacement mainspring, but this is a standard power mainspring. So I think it's probably going to be a little lighter than the factory Smith & Wesson spring, but not so much that I should start to get misfires. I'm also going to be replacing the rebound slide spring inside with a lighter rebound spring. Again, I don't want to go extremely light. I don't want the trigger to start to get sluggish when I release it and it returns to its proper forward position. So I'm not going to go with the absolute lightest spring that I can, but the factory rebound slide spring is about 18 pounds. I'm going to start out with a 15 pound wolf spring and see how that feels. And then if necessary, I'll make adjustments from there. I do have three different rebound slide springs that came from wolf. There's a 15, a 14, and a 13 pound spring. I'm going to start out with the heaviest one because again, I don't want the trigger action to start to get sluggish. Now something I'm going to do in this video is actually show you the disassembly, at least to the point that I'll need to in order to install these springs, of the action and then the reassembly along with installing the springs in the revolver. Now YouTube definitely will demonetize this video because you can't show any sort of disassembly or modification or what have you to a firearm or else they won't approve it for ad revenue. But since so many of you have decided to join the channel and become members and you are now sponsoring videos just like this, I can go ahead and show this type of content without having to worry too much about whether or not YouTube demonetizes it. So with all that out of the way, let's see what we can do with this Model 66 revolver. Now before I start the spring replacement on this revolver, I did make an effort to try to get a current trigger pull weight with my trigger pull gauge, but it does exceed the 12 pound limit of this trigger pull gauge. So we'll see when I get done if I can get a reading. If it's anywhere below 12 pounds, I know that I've made an improvement. And here's the Model 66 up close. The first thing I'm going to do to begin the disassembly is remove the grips, and in order to do that, I'm going to get a properly sized screwdriver and remove the grip screw. And I will do my best to keep all of this in the video frame as I'm working on the revolver. Sometimes when working around a camera, that's a little more difficult than you might expect. But as I said, I'll do my best. With the grips removed, there's a few things that I want to point out before I go any further. First are the screws in the side plate. And take note of these screws because they need to go back in the same holes that they're in now. You notice the one here at the rear of the side plate is flat. The other two both have round heads. And even though they both have round heads, as I said, they can't be interchanged. 
this is a fitted screw to interface properly with the yoke and make sure that the cylinder opens and closes properly. So you need to make sure you get the fitted screw back in this correct hole. Also, we can now see the mainspring that's going to be replaced as well as the mainspring strain screw, which we're also going to need to loosen in order to remove the mainspring. The next screw that I take out is going to be the fitted screw at the front of the side plate. And again, make sure you're using a properly sized screwdriver for this. You don't want the screwdriver to slip and put a big scratch down the side of your revolver. And on the newer screws that retain the yoke, there is actually a spring-loaded plunger that does away with the need to have a fitted screw of proper length. So if you have a newer one, you'll have that, and that's an easy way to know that you have the proper screw for retaining the yoke. If you have one of the older ones like this, as I said earlier, make sure that you take note of which hole this screw came out of and make sure it goes back in the same one. With that screw removed, I can now remove the yoke and the cylinder and I'll just set them off to the side so they're out of the way. And now I'll remove our other two side plate screws. and all of our side plate screws are now removed. At this point, I have to remove the side plate itself. Now, there are some people that will pry this up with a screwdriver. I don't do it that way because you can bend the side plate and then it will never fit properly back on the side of your revolver frame. So what I'm going to do is take my trusty wooden dowel right here and I'm just going to tap the frame. You can already see that side plate is raising up and eventually it'll come loose just like that. And I can now, if I can get a hold of it, lift the side plate right off the side of the frame and I've done no damage to it whatsoever. Also make sure when you do this that you don't lose your hammer block safety because we'll need to put that back in later on. So the next thing I'm going to do is remove the mainspring itself. And in order to do that, I need to unscrew the mainspring strain screw. And you can see where it comes through the frame and it's bearing against the mainspring right there. So give me just a second to get the proper size screwdriver for that. And I'll loosen that screw. And I'm going to loosen that strain screw normally you don't have to take this completely out of the frame. You can just loosen it enough to be able to remove the mainspring. And there it's no longer contacting the mainspring or putting any kind of tension on it. So at this point I can pretty easily remove that mainspring but before I can install the new one, I'm going to have to remove the rebound slide here because you can see here the rebound slide spring is the other one that I'm going to be replacing. So before I remove the rebound slide, I'm going to remove the hammer. To remove the hammer, I am first going to have to move this hammer block safety right here. This is connected to the cylinder latch on the opposite side of the frame. And when I pull back on the cylinder latch, you can see that it moves that hammer block out of the way. This is a safety feature to be able to keep the revolver from being cocked when the cylinder is open. 
So I'm going to pull that back and I'll just pull the trigger all the way to the rear. And I want to hold that there. And at this point, I'll pull the hammer back a little farther and it should raise right out of there very easily, just like that. Now I'll release the trigger and we don't have any reason to remove the trigger, so it's going to stay right where it is. But I'm now going to remove the rebound slide and the rebound slide spring. Now, if you have never removed a rebound slide from a Smith & Wesson revolver, I will tell you this can be a little dangerous. This spring is under a great deal of tension right now, and it has a tendency to want to launch itself out of there. Make sure you are wearing eye protection when you do this, and be careful. I like to use this tool. This is made especially for removing a rebound slide. This comes from Brownells. I don't remember how much I paid for it. I've had it for a number of years, but it does work pretty well for this operation. And as you can see, there is a slot in this tool and it engages the spring at the rear. I'll try to get this so you can see it. Notice the opening at the rear of the rebound slide for the spring. When I push this tool past the post, I can compress the spring and take some of that tension off. Now, as I do that, I'm going to start to raise this up and I'm going to try to keep my finger over the back of this opening to control that spring so it does not come shooting out of there. Cross your fingers and wish me luck. Sometimes I do this better than others. And how about that? I didn't shoot it across the ring today, or across the room today rather, and didn't lose it, and didn't seem to damage anything in the process. So there is our rebound slide, and there is our factory rebound slide spring. Now something I want to point out before I install the new rebound slide spring and start the reassembly is you'll notice in the nose of the rebound slide, there is a hole. And there is this little plunger on the rear of the trigger. When the rebound slide is reinstalled in place, that little plunger on the rear of the trigger has to fit into that hole in the nose of the rebound slide. So make sure you get that in there as you reassemble it. And now I will get my new Wolf 15 pound rebound slide spring. Here are the Wolf springs, by the way, as they come from Wolf. I've got the new mainspring there, and then all three of the rebound slide springs are packaged inside of this one bag. So I'm going to open this up now and get the new, new mainspring and the spring that I'm going to be using for the rebound slide. And here is the new 15 pound rebound slide spring. I'm going to take that out of its package and we'll get ready to install it in the revolver. So now I will simply install that new 15 pound rebound slide spring in the rebound slide and I'm going to move it into position being careful to get that little plunger from the hammer into the proper location now, again, keep your fingers crossed that this goes well. I'm going to use my Brownells tool again to compress this spring. Or at least I'm going to try to. Sometimes you do this and you look like an absolute gunsmith master and sometimes not so much. Today is looking like one of the not so much days. Okay, I've got the spring in place and I'm sliding it down 
into its proper location, and there we go. The new rebound slide spring is installed, and everything appears to be functioning properly. Next, I'll reinstall the hammer, and again, I'm going to pull back on that cylinder latch on the opposite side of the frame and pull the trigger all the way to the rear. And when I reposition the hammer, I'm going to put it back in place exactly the way it came out. And it should more or less fall right back into place just like that. So our hammer is now back in its proper location. Next, I'll reinstall the new mainspring. And here's that Wolf replacement mainspring. Again, this is a standard power mainspring. But something you'll notice with this Wolf design, once I get this out, is that unlike the original factory mainspring, the Wolf spring has a rib that runs down the middle. And part of this, I believe, is to add the proper amount of power to the mainspring without having so much tension that you notice during the course of the trigger squeeze. So again, when I get this all put back together, I'll try to get a reading with my Lyman trigger pull gauge and we'll see just how much difference this spring and the new rebound slide spring are going to make. Okay, you'll notice here at the rear of the hammer is the place where the mainspring hooks on and there are, you're not going to be able to see it I don't think, but there's one of these little posts on either side. So one ear of the mainspring goes on either side there to hook on, if I can get a hold of it again. There we go. And the bottom portion of the mainspring fits into this cutout right here, just like that. And at this point, it's positioned properly, so I'm going to tighten down the strain screw. And wait till my camera focuses a little bit there. Okay, and you want that strain screw to be screwed in tight. You don't want that to start to work its way loose while you're shooting, or else tension will be removed from the mainspring and you'll definitely sooner or later start to experience some misfires. So now I'm going to do a couple of function tests. I'm going to cock the revolver, make sure that it stays cocked, push on the hammer, make sure we won't get a push off. I'm going to squeeze the trigger, the hammer should fall. So in single action, the revolver appears to be working properly. I'm also going to squeeze the trigger. And in double action, the revolver appears to be working properly. So now I'll re replace, I almost said reinstall, but I'll replace that hammer block safety. And eventually we'll also reinstall the side plate. Now, if you notice, on the side of the rebound slide, there is a little stud. And on the rear, or maybe I should say the bottom, of the hammer block safety, there is that cutout, and that's for that stud. And this part goes between the hammer and the frame. When I replace my side plate, what I like to do is start this groove on the back right along the hammer block and you'll notice at the top of the side plate there is a little projection to lock it into the frame so I use the hammer block as a guide for that projection right into position so again I'm going to start the groove right here on the hammer block safety and move that right up into position that will also locate the hammer block safety properly inside of the side plate and now I'm just going to push the side plate down into place and there we go. And the last thing I have to do is replace my screws. Now remember, the screw's in the proper location. 
the flat screw goes here at the back of the frame. And I'm going to have to change my screwdriver bits before I can screw that in. There we go. Right tool for the right job. And I'm just going to screw that back down. And I don't like to fully tighten these just yet but I want to get it in place so it will at least stay there. So no real tension right now. Next is our first round headed screw. Now remember this is not the fitted screw that holds the yoke. And again you need to make sure you keep these going back into the same holes they came out of. And for some reason that one's not wanting to go in there at the moment. There we go. And again, tighten it down just enough to hold it in place there. Now, before I reinstall this screw, we need to put the cylinder back in place. Now, with a fluted cylinder like this one, the easiest thing to do is line up one of the flutes with the yoke stud and when you do that it will clear the frame and allow the cylinder to go right back into position just like that. I can now close the cylinder and I'll reinstall that fitted screw in the front. Okay, now I'm going to tighten down all three of the side plate screws. And you want these tight, but don't apply so much torque that you damage these screw heads, which is possible. And you might notice these screw heads show a little bit of damage right now. That's not for me. That's the way they were when I got them. Okay, now we'll repeat that function test. First off, hammer stays cocked when it's supposed to. It's not pushing off from the single action. We squeeze the trigger and the hammer falls. Pull the trigger in double action mode. Everything moves just like it should. Hammer comes back to the cocked position. The cylinder is locked in place and the hammer falls. I like to check the timing for each cylinder and the cylinder should lock into place each time before the hammer falls. And it does. And it should do the same thing on single action. Okay, everything appears to be working properly, and our revolver is all reassembled except for the grips. Alright, to reinstall our grips, I am going to start out by putting the right panel back in place. By the way, you notice the stud at the bottom of the frame here fits into this hole in the grip, and it fits on there just like that. The left side grip has the screw and we can see the screw hole right there. Again, make sure it fits on there onto that stud. And now all I have to do 
is tighten down the grip screw. This is another one of those screws that you don't want to put tons and tons of torque on because you can crack the grip panels. But you want to get it good and snug nonetheless. There we go, that should be good. And our revolver is now completely reassembled with new springs. Okay, now let's see if we can get a double action pull weight on our revolver. We don't know exactly what it was to begin with, we just know it was something in excess of 12 pounds. And there we have 9 pounds, 13.4 ounces. So we definitely made an improvement in that trigger. Let's try it again. Ten pounds, three point one ounces that time. Let's try one more. Nine pounds, fifteen ounces. So it's coming in right around ten pounds. So we made more than two pounds difference in that double action trigger pull just by replacing those two springs. And by the way, I think that spring kit cost me fifteen dollars. Just out of curiosity, let's see what the single action pull is for this revolver. Two pounds, 15 ounces, so just below three pounds. And I might have actually over pulled that just a little bit. Let me see if I can do a better job this time. Two pounds, 9.5. Try it again. Two pounds, 7.7. .7. So about two and a half pounds for the single action pull and right about 10 pounds for the double action pull. And oh yes, that feels much more like it. Now I'm really looking forward to getting this revolver out on the range. And that's the video. The next time you see this revolver, it will probably be out on the range. In fact, don't be surprised if you see this show up in one of my last law enforcement qualification course videos. In any case, if you have any questions or comments on this video, as always, make sure you forward those to me. Remember, if you order anything from Optics Planet, be sure to use my discount code, which is... And if you use that discount code, it's good for 5% off anything you purchase from Optics Planet. See you next time, folks. And until then, good shooting. Bye-bye.